Hear a man called Ken talking on the phone to a friend called Liz about holiday accommodation. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Hello? Hi Liz, it's Ken here. Hi Ken, nice to hear from you. Are you... This is just a quick call. But Mary and I have just been talking about our summer holiday. We haven't booked a place yet, and we've left it a bit late. We were just wondering if you know of any holiday rentals in your area. It's so nice there. Well, yes. I can think of two or three places that are very nice. What dates have you got in mind? The 10th of July to the 22nd of July. Oh, yes. That is quite soon, isn't it? Well, there's a place near here called Moonfleet. Is that M -O, o N F L E E T? That's right. It's quite a rural location, and it's next to the owner's house, but it's got fields all around it, so it's very pretty. Hmm, sounds okay. Can you tell me a bit more about it? Well, it's an annex to the owner's house, and it's an apartment with two bedrooms, and an open-plan living area. Well, I like the sound of it. Is there anything we might not like about it? Well, it's quite a distance from the nearest shops, that's all. OK. And... Well, I'll tell Mary, but I don't think she'd mind that. Do you know how you book it? You have to book on the internet. There's a web address. It's www.summerhouses. One word? Yes. Then dot com. You'll be able to look at a photograph on that. OK. And what about the others? Where are they? The second one I'm thinking of is called Kingfisher, and that's even more rural. It's a really beautiful location, in fact. It's by the river, and it's got nice views. It overlooks woodland on the other side. Is that an apartment? No, it's a three-bedroomed house, and that's got a dining room, as well as a separate living room and a kitchen. But I expect it's more expensive. You'll have to check the prices. Hmm. It's probably a bit bigger than we need. But our nephew might be joining us. We're not sure yet. How do you book Kingfisher? You have to phone the owner directly. Shall I give you the number? I've got it here in my phone book. It's 01752 669 218. Right. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. And you mentioned a third place? Yes, there's a house that my sister stayed in last year. It's called Sunnybanks. Nice name. And the location of that one is rather different. It's in the centre of a village, but it's a very small and quaint place. Did your sister like it? Oh, yes. It's by the sea, so her children really loved it. What's the accommodation like? I'm not sure about the number of rooms, because I haven't been in it myself, but I think she said it's quite spacious, and I know it's got its own garden. It's not very big, but it's not shared with anyone else, and it's supposed to be very pretty. Any snags? Problems? The only other thing I can think of is that there's nowhere for parking. The streets are too narrow, so you have to leave your car somewhere else, and then walk to the house. It's only about ten minutes away, but... OK. Well, I don't think it matters personally. How do you book it? 
There's an agent you have to contact. I don't know his details, but I can ask my sister and let you know tomorrow. Thanks, Liz. That'd be great. I'll talk to Mary and see what she says. Thanks for your help. That's okay, Ken. I'll speak to you again tomorrow. I hope you find what you're looking for. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 2 You will hear the head teacher of a school giving a talk to parents about some new classrooms. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 14. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for making it along. I know how busy you all are with term coming to an end. As you know, the aim of this meeting is to show you the plans we've got to add two new classrooms and how that will affect the playground. Now, I've heard that quite a few of you are worried that there'll be hardly any playground left, but I want to reassure you that that's not the case at all. I think there's been quite a lot of uninformed talk going on, and people have started worrying unduly. I certainly hope I can dispel any of your concerns this evening. Firstly, I have a plan of what the school should look like, which I'll project onto the screen. The school governors and the developers want to hear your feedback before making final decisions. Your feedback's very important. When I've gone through the plan with you, you can ask questions and we'll discuss those queries in detail. There'll be plenty of time to tell us what you think over the coming weeks. And once the plans are a little more developed, they'll be available online. There'll be a weekly update. And once the actual construction begins, you'll be able to check progress as it happens. Personally, I'm very happy with where we've got to. I knew we had to have the extra space, but I must admit I worried long and hard about what we might have to sacrifice for it. The developers have certainly convinced me that we've made the right decision. You now have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the talk and answer questions 15 to 20. Right, can everyone see the plan now? Good. Let's start at the Balfour Road entrance, since that's where most of you come and go from. The Farley Road entrance and lower playground won't be affected at all. Now... As you come into the top playground, the two new classrooms will be on the right. There'll be a new gate and the steps down will be rebuilt. There'll be a ramp for disabled visitors too. 
On the plan here, only the parts of the building affected by the plans are shown. I'll explain why the hall is marked on later. So, as I said, the new classrooms will be to the right of the entrance, and as you can see, will take up very little of the playground space. We feel the Year Six children need their own area away from the younger children, so. This one on the left of the two rooms will be the new Year Six classroom. As you can see, there's no direct entrance from the playground. The plan is to include a small entrance area here from the playground for coats and boots and so on. Entrance to the classroom will be from that area. There'll also be an additional entrance to the hall from this cloakroom. So children will be able to get to the hall from two different directions, from inside the main building and from the new entrance area. I hope that's clear. Now, as you all know, the hall doubles up as the cafeteria at lunchtime. One of the rumors I heard was that we're planning to dispense with the cafeteria and open up a snack bar. I can categorically state. That replacing healthy school meals with a snack bar is not remotely in our thoughts. The other new classroom, that's the one with the playground entrance here, is going to be an exciting new venture for us. That's because its principal use will be for the preschool and after-school clubs. More and more parents want that facility outside school hours. And we need a dedicated space to run these activities. I think there were also worries about the nursery school, though I'm not really sure why. To be honest with you, I can tell you now that the whole area on the other side of the main school building will be totally unaffected. The nursery will continue operating as it does now. There will be a couple of smaller constructions. Modernization work, really, down here on the other side of the top playground. Cycling into school is getting more and more popular, so we're replacing the old bike sheds with a brand new bicycle bay. There'll be space for sixty bikes. The children's toilets will also be modernized, and the children will be able to enter them from inside the school building. Rather than from the playground as they do now, there'll be brand new staff toilets in that part of the building too. I'm pleased to say. So, I hope that's at least started to allay a few fears. Take a few minutes to look at the plan that I'll get out of the way. Then I'll answer a few questions if you have any. Does that make sense to? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. The next important development in how history is recorded came with print. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. The next important development in how history is recorded came with print. In the eighth century, the Chinese invented paper 
and woodblock printing. Remember that up to this time, very few people could read and write, and so only a very small number of people could understand written history. Suddenly, many books appeared, and many more people learnt to read. In the 14th century, the first printing press was invented in Germany. This reduced how long it took to produce books. The new printing technique quickly spread to other parts of the world. More books appeared, and even more people learnt to read. The first printed newspaper appeared in 1605, and the first daily newspaper in 1702. Now, people could read news stories soon after the event happened, and every event was recorded and stored. The problem with newspaper history is that newspaper reporters could tell the stories they wanted to tell, and not necessarily the truth. Photography was the next important development. We generally agree that photography was born in 1839. Some of the earliest photographs that the public saw were images of the American Civil War. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. People were shocked by the photographs of dead soldiers and for the first time saw the reality of war. By 1850, photographs appeared regularly in newspapers and people now expected the truth. At the end of the 19th century came the first motion picture camera. Soon, history was being recorded as moving images. In the 1930s, television brought moving images into people's homes. More and more people saw history as it happened, and more and more history was recorded. Today, of course, we expect that every event in the world is recorded. Satellite TV and the Internet allow people to watch any event anywhere in the world as it happens. It doesn't matter if the TV cameras are not there. People carry around mobile phones and can record any incident and then share it online. Families have their own video cameras and record their own history. Children now grow up watching their parents and grandparents on film. I'm sure you'll agree that the transition from storytelling to what we have today has been dramatic. And I hope that That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear the first part of one lecture in a series of lectures about environmental issues. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In this lecture series, we have been looking at the most pressing environmental issues that the world faces. One of those issues, global warming, has become very fashionable to talk about in the past decade. Though I'm not trying to diminish its importance as a problem, it must be understood that the effects of an increasingly warm planet will not be seen for many more decades. One problem affecting the lives of people right now is the scarcity of water. The need for fresh water will only increase as the world's population grows, especially in developing countries. In the future, changing weather patterns that come with global warming will only make the problem worse. People need water to drink, cook food, shower and wash clothes. Most of the planet is covered with water, but unfortunately only a tiny percentage of it is fit for human use. Of all the water in the world, less than 3% is fresh water. More than two-thirds of that remaining percentage is locked up in glaciers in Greenland, Antarctica and elsewhere, also unavailable for human use. The water vital for life comes from lakes, rivers, underground aquifers, rain and snow. This surface water, groundwater and precipitation, is not disturbed equally across the Earth's surface. For example, Canada, which has about one-half of one percent of the world's people, contains about ten percent of the world's readily available fresh water. Brazil makes up about three percent of the world's population, but within its borders contain nearly twelve percent of the world's fresh water resources. As the economies of developing countries grow, the need for fresh water also grows. One example of this has to do with the production of meat. In some countries, the demand for beef increases when people earn more money. However, raising cattle is incredibly water-intensive, requiring about 15 tons of water for one kilogram of grain-fed beef. The scarcity of water has a direct impact on human life. When people are forced to walk many kilometers to the nearest source of fresh water, it may take hours away from their day. This, in turn, takes time away from school or from other productive work that helps the general economy. A number of solutions have been proposed to deal with the scarcity of water. Some of them are technological, like the construction of desalination plants. These plants convert brackish salty seawater into water fit for human use. They are very expensive to operate and maintain, though, and cannot meet the world's growing demand for water. Other kinds of solutions involve only a little technology or involve modifying individual people's habits. In a rural part of India, a village facing water shortage started collecting rainwater. A simple system allowed them to save water that fell over a large area and use it during dry periods. In the suburbs that surround the cities of developed countries, house owners are using xeriscaping techniques. The main purpose of xeriscaping, unlike traditional landscaping, is not to use supplemental irrigation. This requires the use of plants, shrubs and trees that are appropriate for the climate. In dry areas, this means planting ones that use less water. In the future, many countries will need to use a variety of these techniques in order to provide enough water for their citizens. Water security will be of utmost importance to those governments, especially in areas that are politically unstable.